All right, what's up, everybody? My boy Zach. Back again. Episode four. So we're going to have a continuation on our discussion from episode three, but this is going to be more of hindsight of Zach's story relative to his growth, some of the mistakes he's had, the um, enormous amount of work that he had to get to where he was, um, and then I'll, I'll chirp in a little bit on the growth of my company and some of the challenges and stories that I have. And uh, we want to give a very realistic perspective on uh, the fun parts about being an entrepreneur, but also the not so fun parts. So uh, listen up. Thanks. So Zach, just tell me a little bit about uh, your story from kind of looking back and what you, what's the mistakes you made, some, some of the, the crazy stories you had and all that. So. For sure. So uh, the, the, the first thing I'm going to say is I tell people this whether you're an entrepreneur or not. You know, you have to have uh, a 10-year at minimum, a five-year plan and work backwards. I don't care, you know, if you're trying to own your own business, if you're trying to get a job, if you're looking at your career that you're currently in. I mean, you've got to say, hey, 10 years from now. Uh, at minimum five years from now, where do I want to be? I mean, there's a quote, I don't know exactly who said it, but it says, if you don't know where you're going to be in five years, you're already there. Yep. And so, so many people don't go into it with that mindset. They just say, oh, I'm going to jump in it, and they're not looking at it. Okay, well, what do I want to achieve? Ten, where do I want to be 10 years from now? And actually visualize yourself there. And I'm talking about everything from, you know, not only business-wise, but also personal. Because if you're not personally happy in anything you're doing, you're not going to be successful. At. So that's the first thing. So that kind of kind of gives you an idea of what I'm about to say next in regards to, you know, owning my own business. Okay, when I when I did this, I was 23 years old, first starting. You know, I, I didn't know where I wanted to be in 10 years. I didn't know how to. I didn't know. I didn't think growth. I didn't think expansion. I didn't think you know just a small little things that, you know, ended up being a huge big deal at the end. Um, so the first thing I'd say, you know, you got to have that that go to market strategy. You got to have an, an vision of where you want to be. Yeah, I think it's important to have that. You you look at it. You, What's more than likely going to happen is that you're not going to end up there anyways. Right. But you at least have a, a general idea of what it looks like, and then you reverse engineer those steps to how you're going to get there. Totally. Worst case is if, if you're off 40 to 45 degrees, right. you still have the general idea of the direction you're going. Exactly. So then you just and you just make minor changes to the plan. Totally. And you and you at least you're rolling because so yep. many people you know are so scared to just jump out and make a and, and make a decision. I mean they they'll sit down and they'll maybe they'll write a plan, but they don't actually get going with it. And to your point, you know as long as you may be a little bit off, you may make a mistake or hey. You know, you may put something, I want, to, I want to achieve this in year five, um, but it doesn't happen until year six and a half. Okay, well, who cares? I mean, at least you're rolling, and at least you've made a start, and you can always make adjustments, but at least yeah. you got the ball rolling. So, you know, when I first started, that was something that I didn't do. You know, I opened up, and my first store in Orlando it was an Orlando Premium Mall right there uh, on, on iDrive in Orlando. I mean, we did like $1.3 million. Food cost was crazy, crazy, labor was crazy, but, you know, we're in Orlando. We had a high price point. Yeah. We could make sales. And we and we had a tourist crowd, so you know, tour, tour, you know, people on vacation, they don't mind paying six bucks for a bottle of water. It wasn't a big deal, right? So, you know, we had those advantages, but we didn't think, okay, hey, you know, ten years from now, do I want to have thirty stores in Orlando? Do I want to have a hundred stores in Florida? You know, we looked at it like, hey, I'm just going to open up stores, and we ended up opening fifty-five stores in six and a half years, but none of those stores were in the same area. And you know, when you're trying to you talk about the why, or why, why do people go to you know, uh, In-N-Out? Why do they go to Chick-fil-A? Why do they you know, buy Nike? Why, why are people so brand loyal? Why do they like Apple or Samsung or whatever? Because those, those companies have set up a, a game plan like, hey, this is what we're trying to accomplish in 10 years. And you, once you have a customer locked in, I mean, unless you really piss them off or unless your product really falls off, you're not going to lose them. No. And so we're clear, if, I assume most people have listened to episode three. Zach owned a, a franchise called Chicken Now. And so Chicken Now was like a fast casual concept, exactly. somewhat like a Chick-fil-A or something, but more homemade. Uh, homemade. Exactly. It's, it's, not, it's not so like uh, industrialized or commercialized, right? So. Right. So the, the next step, I mean, for the restaurant people out there, you know, this, it sounds, you know, it's not only philosophical as to why do you want to think like this, but now you start talking about your cost. Okay. So let's say if you, you know, you know, you're going to open up, uh, you know, and Five Guys does a great job of this. You know, they started out in, in, in D.C. and they expanded and they go in areas. And when they first started, the first two years, they were catching hell. I remember in Orlando, hell, my first, my first store was doing better than them. But then, you know, two years later, now they got 15 units in Orlando. Now they got, you know, 30 units in Central Florida. When people grow like that, you know, now you can go back to your food supply and say, hey, I want contract pricing. I want this. I want that. 
you know, it makes labor, it makes makes food costs, it makes everything, not to mention just just the natural appeal. Kind of scale, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, in an earlier episode, we talked about that education piece. But, you know, you, when somebody's got 30 locations in your city, you know, that's that's all the branding and education you need if you're on every corner. And that's uh, that's key. So a lot for those entrepreneurs out there, you got to think like, hey, where do I want to be? And let's really think about this. Don't go into it thinking, you know, if you want to just be that one mom and pop store, that's completely fine. But if you're trying to grow and you're trying to expand, you've got to put yourself 10 years ahead and look backwards. I think, too, at his point, if you want to be your mom and pop store, it's OK if your goal isn't to say, well, I'm going to go ahead and sit back after three years and not do anything. Because mm-hmm. the reality is, is you can say, OK, well, this store did 1.3 million, right? Is that enough for you to survive based on the, the tiny no. margins of restaurants? It's, no. it's not. So your goal does not match either the work ethic or, mm-hmm. or, or your overall vision. And so you're going to have to then change that so it actually makes sense. Right? Totally. Yeah. And that's the thing, too. A lot of, a lot of mom and pop stores, you know, you, they have to accept and it's tough that in a lot of ways you just created a job for yourself. Yeah. You're not really, uh, I don't want to say you're not an entrepreneur because obviously it took entrepreneurial skills to get open and get running and you, you do have a business. But in a lot of ways, it, you know, it's like that one franchise owner. You just, you just created a job. You're not trying to grow. And that's fine if you're not trying to do that, but you just got to admit like, hey, this is the situation I'm in. I'll, I'll yeah. be in the kitchen or I'm going right. to be wiping tables for, for 15, 20 years. Right. Then I'll sell it, make some money, and I'll be happy, right? Exactly. Just, yeah, so I think that's quite important. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you went from one at 1.3 to 55, okay. what your involvement so, was and all that. I mean, a lot of it was, a lot of it was, uh, a lot of it was luck. A lot of it was because the person that I was uh, in business with had the real estate connections and because we were going inside mall food courts. So our first store opened up in 2007. This is right before the recession hit. Yeah. And people were still going to the malls. You know, it, we still had a good, you know, we started going out in, in tourist areas and opened up in outlet malls where people were, you know, more inclined to shop. But, um, you know, because my first store did so well, and like I said, my business partner at the time, his dad, they already had connections in the food court business. So, you know, pretty much any mall in America, he already knew who to call as far as wow. a leasing agent, but he didn't have a chicken concept, and that's where we came in. That's where it was, value was for him, yeah. Totally, because, I mean, anybody in the mall business will tell you, you know, sometimes dealing with, you know, uh, I don't, bigger name companies is tough. You know, they, they want, you know, uh, incentive, incentive rent. They want different, you know, clauses in there in their lease. So it's, it's tough when you're dealing with a bigger, like a chick, the Chick-fil-A's and McDonald's. Yeah. So a smaller player like me was more appealing to a, a landlord. I'll pay higher rent. Hell, I'll open up on Sunday yeah. and I'll, you know, you, you can lock me in with, you know, 10 different deals and I'm, my hands are tied. So that's how we were able to grow. My second location was in Houston and that was another million dollar store. Um, third, third store was in Seattle, another million dollar store until they had a gang shooting in the mall. Really? Um, yeah, it was in South Center Mall in Seattle. I uh, had a gang shooting right in the, right outside the food court. I'll never forget it. I mean, first week we opened, I think, I think first four days we opened, we did like over 50 grand. We just thought, hey, man, this is, this is a hit. And that, that goes to show you, like, you can have a great plan. You can have the best food, the best employee, the best manager. But you're going to have obstacles like this that you can't, you can't uh, anticipate. And I remember telling my buddy, I mean, I'm like, we got four stores in L.A. and there's a gang shooting in Seattle. I'm like, come on. Like, I didn't even know they had gang bangers in Seattle. But they had them that day in my food court. And that whole mall tanked. I mean, and it's now recovered. But this is just like, you know, shit happens. And you, took a while, oh, too. totally. I mean, who wants to go to the mall and get shot? Yeah. I mean, Zach, your chicken's good, but it ain't that good, right? <laughs> I mean, I'll go to Chick-fil-A and be safe. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be good. Right. So, yeah, so it's like things like that. You can't, you can't, you can't predict, man. I mean, it's, it's hard to say, but you just, you really can't. It's, it's impossible. And you're going to constantly get curveballs like that thrown at you. And you've got to roll with the punches because you're not only the leader, but you've got so much time, energy, emotion, and money invested. It's funny. I have a story like that where we had an employee many many years ago um that yeah, we had we had to actually stay at our building for like three weeks because he was had didn't have a, a place to live which is a terrible idea mind you this was like literally in the first like two years of the year the business was open um and he was just not a not a very good person but we just you know we, like you said in the episode last episode you just want to help people but you don't realize like unfortunately you can't do that yeah. in business all the time so we did that he was staying there slept there and it started having some drinking issues. We clearly knew that right away. But but right as we knew that, it was only like this is a matter of like three days, just so we're clear. It wasn't like we let it yeah. go. He took our truck and trailer after work, went to Best Buy to buy to buy something. Ended up running out of the store, and it was, and he went like on a high speed chase, mind you, with a truck and trailer, but like sixty five miles, seventy miles per hour in like a forty zone yeah. in Escondido. And I'm getting a call from the cops saying, "Hey." Uh, 
what the fuck's going on? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god. And this, but, but to be clear, I was still in the, in the corporate world at this point. Right. So my buddy was running the company, right. and this is well over his freaking. Right. He's like, man, I ain't getting paid enough to deal with this shit, right? <laughs> so, so, TV that so we jumped right. in the car, we had GPS in the vehicle because I was, thank God, that's something I started out very early. When tracked him down, uh, clearly fired him. They arrested him. It was he ended up giving the thing back to Best Buy. It was, it was right. stupid, but it was like a thirty dollar headset or something. Right, right. It's just ridiculous. It wasn't even something that was going to get him in trouble. And, and nothing ever happened of it, but it's just like those type of things. Like, who, who what would have, what happens if he hit somebody and killed somebody? Totally. And, and so many times, people other than, you know, are not thinking that way. But you bring up a great point. I can't tell you how many times, I mean, I've, I've bailed people out of jail, let people borrow my car, giving people payday advances. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I mean, all of those type of things. You, you, anybody who says business tells you, like I say, it's, it's a people business. Yep. And when you are grassroots, like you and I are, you know, you want us. You want to be infectious. You want to rub off on people. You want it to be. You want somebody else to kind of share your your enjoy your story. And you're like, hey, you know, I remember working 90 hours a week and had another job and doing this. And I remember, you know, taking loans out to get my business going. And you you want to be inspiring to somebody else. But unfortunately, you know, you have to pick and choose. And you learn when you get burned yeah. that it doesn't work that way. And then you you're trying to help, but in a lot of ways you're hurting them. And at a certain point too, you can sit there and then you start asking yourself, well, Zach's a good dude, so I'm gonna loan it to him. But I didn't do the last guy. And it's like, aside from the fact that then Zach still might burn me, the reality is, is that then, now there's HR compliance laws right. with that, right? Because right. it's like, oh, well, you're loaning me money, but not him because of right. A, B, and C. Like, right. you, you just can't, now you're getting into that part. And it's like, so there's just so much nonsense with business that you get. So it's totally. just like, you got to say, no employee loans, no matter what. Sorry, right. it's not my issue. I'm, no. I, I, lo- I love you, but it right. just can't, can't do it, right? No, I can't. Can't loan my car, can't do, you know. And, and, and even besides the money, just having, just having that direct point of contact. Like I said, when I first started, I mean, everybody could call me directly. And at first I liked that because I wanted to know what was going on yeah. in my businesses. Not to micromanage them, but just to be there as a lifeline if they needed help. Yeah. But the problem is people take advantage of that. And then now, instead of having a process where people have a manager or a, a district manager or a shift manager, now they can jump all of that and go right to the CEO or the boss. And now you've become you know, the person who's managing the dishwasher or the, the cashier or the cook. And it's tough you know, because you're, at that time I was you know, young, vibrant, I wanted to be there. And I was learning too, and I didn't want to admit that to them because I wanted obviously to stay. But I, I mean, anybody that tells you different is lying. You're always learning. You're always trying to get better. And if you are really in love with what you do, you want to be on the front lines. Hell, I love I love going to stores and talking to customers. So many so many of my best ideas. I was the first, I believe, I, I was the first fast food company to have a, a contract with Kraft for Kool Aid. I mean, you know, it, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Fried chicken and Kool-Aid, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the only reason I thought of Kool-Aid was because my store in Orlando, you know, a black girl came up to me. She's like, oh, I, I would eat here every day, but I can't do it. I'm like, why can't you do it? She's like, oh, you guys don't have Kool-Aid. And on the days I forget my Kool-Aid from home, you know, I don't eat here. Yeah. I was like, well, screw that. Tomorrow we got Kool-Aid. You know, and then you take, think about it, right? right. You know, but if I hadn't been at the store and if I hadn't been up front, I never would have heard that. Yeah. And I never would have had a na- national contract with Kraft for that. I never would have you know, been one of the few fast food chains to have Kool-Aid in their stores. It's, and it's not a Kool-Aid story. It's a story of being there and with an ear to the ground and hearing what customers want, good or bad. I think the other point of that, uh, what you were saying there too, which is big for me, it's happened just yesterday, in fact, to a vendor of mine, um, but he's a good friend, so it's a little bit different, is, is that he came to me and said, we're having some issues internally with my service company when it comes to ordering supplies from him, just a lack of communication, nothing earth shattering. And he came to me and said, I'm, I'm concerned about this. And I, and so I said, okay, that's no problem. So then I go to my general manager and the minority owner, and he goes, well, I haven't got a call for this. What the hell? Right? So I, so I don't mind taking the calls like you were, but the problem is, is you're, you're almost stepping on the toes of your mm-hmm. subordinates then mm-hmm. because they feel like, well, then I'm not doing my job right. right. And that's how my general manager felt like, well, shit, man, give me a chance. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so even though you want to be that lifeline and you can, it has to be in the right environment, in my opinion, because where maybe you just have like a state of the union discussion yeah. and people where it's open and you can have discussions on things, but it can't be like... Because it, it used to be like that here at Green Guard, but the problem is, is then people go, I just want to talk to Nate if they don't want to, yeah. if they don't like the answer of their boss. And right. it's like, if that's the policy, I'm going to, I'm going to, if I all of a sudden now start overriding what, what their bosses say, it's, just, yeah. it, it's not going to yeah. work, right? Then they're going to be like, well, screw Nate then. What importance am I here? Totally. Right? And I get owners, trust me, I get it. It's your baby. You know, you want to know what's going on. You, I mean, you started this thing from the ground up. I mean, this is literally like a child, but you know, if you, if you're going along those lines, you're only going to make it harder for yourself and you're, you're going to cripple people good people who are qualified to make decisions mm-hmm. for you and you're going to uh, limit your growth and that's that's the key i mean a good example of that is like the rich carlton mm-hmm. hey mr king the second you walk in right they know your name which is right. there's a whole like culture thing with them yeah 
But then they will, I don't, maybe this has changed over the years, but last I read, they even let their housekeepers comp up to 500 bucks if there's an issue. They don't even, it doesn't, they just, they give the authority or autonomy to their employees to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with maybe, maybe your chicken now, you can say, yeah. You guys have, you know, right. 50 bucks a day to comp if there's problems, yeah. right? Same thing with like bartenders or restaurants and things like that, exactly. right? And so if you do that and give that autonomy, it's amazing when you actually give employees a little bit of independence and power, um, how, how successful they can be as long as, again, it's, it's managed and, and it's, there's, it's in, inside of some form of a box so it doesn't get outrageous. Oh, and subconsciously what you're telling them is that there's growth. Yeah. Like I, I don't mind investing my career here or sticking with you guys because I know you trust me enough to make the small decisions. So you trust me enough that eventually one day I'll be able to make a bigger decision. You just give them a little bit, yeah. at least on the leash, a little bit more, a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. and so talk a little bit about your, because we talked off camera yeah. about this, about okay. your work ethic and the time you had to put in. Okay, so here we go. So, <laughs> I mean, this is it's so many sleepless nights, so many, you know, you, you lose count. So the first thing is this, like there's, there's no, if you're looking for a schedule, if you're looking for, you know, a nine to five, anything normal or routine, I mean, this is, this is definitely not the, the, the walk of life for you. I can tell you. From 2007 to 2009, I opened up 25 locations. I was on the road every week. Sometimes my friends used to joke and said I had an NBA schedule because I was in three cities a week, right? You're just checking on stores, managing people. Um, but, you know, the time invested away from your family, the time, in, so it's got to be something you love because you're going to miss out on so many other things. And if you don't love it and if you're not passionate, you, you're not going to be able to succeed. But I mean, I mean, starting out, you know, hell, I was, I think I was making, you know, paying myself two grand a month, you know, just to, just to kind of make sure everything, keep the lights on, make sure all the employees were paid and everything was taken care of. So, you, you know, you're not even getting the financial gain in the, in the beginning. Most restaurant business fail within the first two years. Yeah. So, I mean, hell, just for you to break even, you know, the first two years, you're already a success. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, for me, it was a little bit different because I was on the road in different cities. So, you know, maybe somebody who opens up 55 restaurants in San Diego, you know, they get to go home and go, go in their bed every night. You know, I'm sleeping in hotels. Sometimes I'd be too tired to book the hotel, have to sleep in the rental car. You know, even if I did take the ho get a hotel, just quick shower back at the shop. You know, you're training people. You got to be there to open, be there to close. I mean, minimum 90 hours a week. I think for the first six years, I didn't even take a day off. Um, and unfortunately, on my sixth year, um, and it's like, you know, my dad ended up passing away and I was so busy opening the store, I couldn't even, I couldn't even make his, own, his funeral. So, I mean, that's something I still live with, but that just shows you the amount of of, of a dedication you have to have. And you know, in the beginning when you do your business plan, people say, oh, okay, yeah, I'm down to do that. And it could be your girlfriend, your wife. I mean, I, I thank God I did, but I, I lost three girlfriends during chicken now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't regret that, but, but my point is like, that's a relationship that you know, I never would have even had, I never had a chance to really fully enjoy, even if I wanted to, because I was working. Yeah, yeah, just, and, and you know, if you don't have the right person or partner, they, they're not gonna understand that. And it's not even about money. I mean, you can, you can be, you can be the best sugar daddy in the world, but it's uh, people want time, you know, especially people close to you. I can tell you a personal story with my wife uh, and I, which I've said on some other podcasts that I'm part of. But uh, with Green Guard, I went from making uh, close to a quarter million dollars a year. I'm very transparent with people um, in sales. I was at a very high level sales type of environment, all the way down to making thirty grand a year for the first two years. Mm -hmm. with, with I mean that and. For people to understand that, that 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 takes that a significant jump to do that because mm -hmm. that's I mean you're earning a decent living right being pretty mm -hmm. happy cool. and and at that point I wasn't having to work more than forty hours a week and in I was San Diego and yeah in San Diego and cheap right <laughs> yeah, so. and so luckily I had an nest egg because of mm -hmm. that cause I was smart with my money and then I went and made I was making basically nothing kind of like you were mm -hmm. yeah and then on top of that I, I have this discussion with my wife hey we're gonna do this are we on the same page yes you understand I'm literally going to be living there like from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., six days a week minimum, and then the this, this seventh day I'll be there for eight, nine hours. And so we might get a couple hours together. And of course, she's been the most supportive wife in the face of the planet and says yes. But the reality is, is no matter how much you try to like, you know, theoretically yeah. explain that to somebody, you can't. you can't. So the reality is, is that it definitely put a strain on the marriage at that time, mind you, that was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, Ish, you know, for, in, for the relationship and then the marriages, uh, and we both gained a ton of weight, like 50, 60 pounds, and it wasn't it was super wasn't healthy. And I'm not telling everybody out there that wants to be an entrepreneur, he has to be as psychotic as Zach and I here. <laughs> there is a little bit of a balance, oh, right? Totally. But Zach and I have, have this mentality of just like you're gonna do it, just go yeah, absolutely a thousand yeah. miles per hour, straight forward, no matter what, right? And we're both younger too, yeah. so we probably yeah. if we were to do it over now again, you'd probably be a little bit different, but. The hours are going to be there. It's definitely going to put a strain on the relationship. It's definitely going to take a significant amount of time. And if you're not prepared to give up that time in other capacities of your life, no. it's like he said, it's just not it's not for you to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. um, there there are exceptions to every rule. 
um, you know, when it comes to things you do, if you, especially if you do like online product sales and things like that. Um, but for businesses that truly, truly want to grow and you want to get in the millions of dollars, uh, there's very, very few exceptions of any where you're not going to have to put an immense amount yeah. of time into it, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and just be prepared for that and make sure that everybody around you and your circle and your specifically your significant other and all that are ready to support you on that and have an actual true plan because it's if you don't it's going to be really tough yeah and and very and people will resent you for it oh. you know here you are trying to provide a better life or do whatever and people will literally hate you for not investing that time because they if they don't have your vision or if they haven't completely bought in they, they won't get it or they're gonna you know yeah. the old term of like haters are gonna all your friends are gonna be like man you're, you're ridiculous you're just wasting your time in your life and you're you're losing the, right. the your best time of your life yeah. partying and stuff. <laughs> and my thing is, is and again, it, it, I didn't necessarily argue with them, but I said I'd rather ha have a little bit of money, and then when I do have the fun in the clubs, I can or it, it, whatever right. I'm no. doing, I can spend it. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not sitting there having to sh shoestring things together because I didn't, yeah, exactly. you know. And the reality is too is that my vision was what, what, what my life looked like at you know 40 years old, not at 22, mm -hmm. right? And that's the key. And that is the key. And that, and and so a lot of friends are like, "This is ridiculous, Kimmy. You're doing this, you know." And you just have to say. You know, and that for me, that's, I've always remembered that type of stuff and then the chip on my shoulder saying, okay, prove you wrong, prove you wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, just, that's what worked for me. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, those, those work hours, just be prepared for that if you're wanting to do something like this. Totally. Yeah, and a lot of it is just, it's nonstop. It's nothing you can dodge or it's, so, it's so, inevitable. So tell us a little bit about through those 90-hour work weeks and sleeping in your car and all that, some of the things, maybe some of the stories or things that you would to tell, uh, the viewers might want to know that are some things that they want to, to try to avoid. Okay, so I'd say the first thing, like we talked about, is being being so you know dispensable um, because you know as you're if you if you're somewhere ninety hours a week working, chances are somebody's there with you, right? So they see, or, or you might even have multiple groups of people there with you, depending on if you're in a restaurant, a shift change, or whatever. So you're easy, you're easily accessible. People know where you are. Now, if I want to find you, I just pull up on Green Guard. I mean, yeah. you're not you're not at uh, Omnia downtown. No. You know, I know where to find you, and so that makes it tough. Because you now you you're trapped, you know, in a good way. You're at your business, but you're also, you know, so so easily uh, tangible. Um, so I think that's that's one of the things you know you just try to avoid. You know, having a system in place where you you're there, but you you know I used to tell my employees, you know, if you need me, let me know, but try not to need me. You know? Yeah, I, I think one of the things too is that I really focused on with Green Guard and what's hard, and some of the customers are if they listen to this, they're gonna say you fucking Nate, this is what this is what happens. <laughs> but but is that. You want the business to be known as Chicken Now or Green Guard, not Zach's Restaurant and, and Nate's Hood Cleaning Company. Right. And so naturally, as a business grows, especially one location down in Florida, mm -hmm. it was always Zach's place. Let's go to Zach's place. I'm sure that's what oh, your boy did. And it, hey, let's call Nate. Let's call Nate. Let's call Nate. At a certain point in Green Guard, I literally had to stop answering the phone to clients. Yeah. I hated it. It was like one of the hardest things I've ever had to do because you're right. like, feel like you're you're not. They're letting people down. Yeah, you're letting them down. But on the other hand, it's like. There's no chance I'm ever going to let, one, let this place grow, and two, be able to be somewhat disconnected and leave for a couple of weeks on vacation right. if I don't do this. Totally. That most clients start adapting to that and realizing, oh, wow, Nate does have a staff, and they're going to be more helpful. Exactly. And he's not going to say, hey, let me get back to you about the schedule because, shit, right. I hadn't looked at it. The same thing with you. you. When you get to a certain point, you can't even answer the questions for him because you don't, you don't have your yeah. pulse on it that way. Yeah, and it's not your job. But I think the tough part is, you know, anybody, I know I, know I had this. You really you hate to admit this, but customers are, in the beginning are just coming because you're you're, you're Zach. Yep. Like you know, I would have gone to J. Fil A, but you're my boy. Oh, no, 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 no. So that that's that loyalty piece or that feel you piece where you feel like you're letting people down. Um, but stuff like that, yeah, definitely try to avoid that. And I would say another thing too, man, just um, you know, just try to avoid. You know, you have a lot of emotion, um, but when you when you're a leader and people are looking at you, and you know, I'm, I'm a big guy, so just my presence alone. You know, I'm six six, three hundred forty pounds. If I stand up, I mean. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much bigger than any of my employees, right? So just that, just that intimidation and people know you're so emotionally attached to it, you know, you intimidate people and they're scared. They're scared to try yeah. or they're scared to do is maybe what they should do because yeah. they don't want to let you down yeah. or, you know, so Make that's, mistakes. yeah, you know, and it, it's, it's tough. Yeah, I think that I, I um, clearly I'm not 6'6", 340. <laughs> Sorry, but you're but you intimidating, Nate. <laughs> I'm 5'6", 170. So. Hey, but you're, but you're still a monster. Yeah, but the reality is... For me is that I'm a very intense person, so yeah. I even like one of my new employees that's handling my uh, apparel uh, business, shameless plug, Green Guard Printing Apparel. Mm-hmm. T-shirt printing. Exactly. <laughs> um, but, but I get, because I'm so intense, Yeah. That people are a little bit like, oh shit, I don't want to piss Nate off, and it's like once they get to know me, they're yeah. like, oh, he's just this is how he is around everything, right? Totally. But it's one of those things when you're going into business, you have to know a careful balance with that. I can tell you one of my biggest challenges was becoming a good, effective leader. I still uh, clearly have a long way to go, in my opinion, but 
I've got a lot better at that. And it's because you just don't, you learn to, to know when to react to certain things the way you need mm -hmm. to react to certain things and not just like think the, end, the world's ending every single time something happens. Right? Totally. And I think it's tough because, you know, you have a sports background and so do I. And I, 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 the best way I compare it is, you know, back when I was you know, playing in Florida, we didn't have like Miami or Tennessee, Tennessee and we were terrible during this time. And you could literally just walk that whole week of practice. You could just look at, at players. Oh, man, we got Miami this week, you know. Andre Johnson and everybody else. So we got Tennessee, you know, you know, you just you're going to it defeated. And so, you know, as a leader, you try to instill that emotion to get people riled up and get them going. But sometimes if people don't have the same buy in, it's, it's too intense and it's too overwhelming. Yeah. They're like, dude, you're like, you know, I, I didn't I didn't invest the money in this. Like, I'm just a, I'm just an employee. Like, yeah. give me a break. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. and, and you really you want to say, well, get the hell out of here. Because yeah. like, if you're not if you're not bought into it, I mean, you're not, you know, I don't want you on my team anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and so you, get, you definitely want to do that at a certain point. But the other thing, too, with that is find what makes employees tick, right? Mm -hmm. certain, certain people get really motivated by the work-life balance. And so then what you do is you reward them for working as efficiently as possible and getting all their things done, mm -hmm. right? And then certain people really like the long hours and like to show that they're, they're grinding and all that stuff. And so you just find out what makes employees tick. Everybody's different, right? Totally. Like There's a guy that I, I met this morning that's one of our foremen that I see every so often. And he really enjoys flying his drone every... And, and the fact that you just go ask him about his drone, he's like, his eyes light up. He's like, oh, Nate asked me about right, this, right. right? And then you ask another dude about like what he's doing on the weekends. He's not going to want to talk to you about playing video games. Right. right? And so you, yeah, so for him, it's just you have a different discussion, right? Mm -hmm. And so naturally, as you get to 55 locations, you won't be able to go that specific with employees. Mm -hmm. But you can, you can have a general idea of what makes general people tick and, and totally. approach them that way, right? Exactly. I think it's really important. And, and learning that early on as an entrepreneur is really important because, again, we're going back to the employee part. You have good employees that will literally make your company go. It's not good clients. Good good employees make good clients. Yeah, and one thing too that I learned the hard way to talk about looking back is you know in order to having good employees, you have to give employees good processes. Yeah. And you know if you have a good process, I mean it could be a training, it could be vacation, it could be any of those HR things or just like you know guidelines as to hey who we are, why we're here. Yeah. And once people buy into that, then you can kind of help cultivate the people because people come and go. Yeah. I mean you can have the best employment. I'm pretty sure you've had some great employees leave. Yeah. I know I did, and you can't blame them. You're happy for them. Make you know hell, you right, right. somebody wants to be Nate Junior or Zach Junior, more power yeah. to them. Yeah. And they were they did a great job while they were there for you. But if you didn't put money and time and effort into that process, mm -hmm. then you know it, it's easier to help that employee transition while they're here. I mean that's my world at this point. I, I aside from helping with the sales in a little in a minor capacity. Capacity, all I do is process development, right? Because the reality is, is that I was just talking to uh, somebody last night that owns the gym about um, when the gym doesn't have the higher turnover, but like build a process and, and because he, this is somebody open a different gym. So, and what I like to do is video SOPs, standard operating procedures, because you're sitting there going like this right. and expecting an employee that's brand new to read yeah, 15 bad. pages. They're not going to comprehend that. But if they could watch a video saying, oh, this is how I clock in. This is how I log into the computer. This is how I... This is how I make the sauce, but it's oh. not on video, or, but that's just a process. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, now it's not Zach having to retrain his fifth kitchen guy this last yeah. three months. It's, hey, watch the video, and then you can, then all you do is just do quality control checks. Exactly. There we go. So I think that's real important to do that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that, that, anything else you want to add no, to your story? I mean, like I said, just looking back, I mean, you're going to make mistakes. It's going to be a rough road, but I mean, in the long run, it's so, so well worth it. Yeah, so recap of episode four, we talked about the, the work ethic that's needed to start your own business. Uh, the intention in which you have to have a long-term plan, making sure that it's very clear and not just saying, I want to be a millionaire or I want to be a $10 million company, but how you, what road you're going to get to get there. Uh, a little bit about employees and the critical importance of making sure that they're taken care of. And uh, episode four, Zach King, the man, myth, legend, whatever you want to call him. <laughs> Good looking out, people. Thanks. Yes, sir. Startup Nation.